hear me. His cousin American. Чем сила? А вы что, собираетесь на ней жениться? Да. Ух, красота-то какая. Лепота. Таможня дает добро. Я вообще не называю меня, пожалуйста, Вероника. Кто я? От кто я? Отныне... Русские земля единый быть. My name's Ali, and this is the Rus Files Unite podcast, where we watch Russian films and films with a Russian connection. As always, I am joined by a guest, and today I am joined by a returning guest. So, hi, Martin Kessler. Nice to have you on the show again. Hello, it's great to be back. So, long-time listeners, Martin will remember you from the My Friend Ivan Lapshin episode, but for those who haven't caught up with a back catalogue. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, sure. I'm a filmmaker and sound editor, and I do lots of podcasting over on flixboys.com. Uh, if folks want to check out that site, uh, they might want to listen to the Whitnail and I episode, which you're a guest on, so <laughs> that might be a good entry point for listeners. Yeah, I will uh, I will talk about with Nail and I to anyone who will give me the opportunity. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for plugging that particular episode. Yeah. It's been a little while since we since we last talked. What have you been up to since then, both in terms of the filmmaking and and the the podcasting? Because obviously there is Flix Flixwise Canada, but you're you're a guest on quite a few other things as well. Oh sure, it's a it's a big long list of things. I I think probably people's best bet is just to follow me on Twitter at Movie Kessler, where I update pretty regularly whatever my projects are or latest podcasts are, and you can see I've got lots and lots of things on the go. Yeah, 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 and uh, and Podchaser is is pretty good as well. In that you know it, you can find Martin on there and and me on there, and then you can see the other podcasts we've been on besides you know our main one that that we each that we each host <laughs> um i wanted to give a particular shout out to you've been on uh we cut heads a couple of times now i'm trying to remember what film it was, was that you were on back for. when it was the um the kurosawa podcast the high and low podcast and now that yes. it's uh, focused on spike lee i went on a episode to talk about melvin van people's early film story of a three-day pass and watermelon man so people might like oh that. that's yeah. right yes yeah. And uh, recently I was on Wrong Reel. I, I talked about a uh, film with the Russian connection, uh, Soviet era film V, which is based on the Gogol story, which draws on Ukrainian folklore. And it's uh, it's a lot of fun. So if people want to hear me talk about something else that might be kind of connected to the podcast, uh, that that might be a good one too. Yeah, that's that's well worth, uh, worth checking out. Yeah, I mean... Gogol sits in a kind of funny position in regard to Russian literature, as you mentioned on the on the episode. He was actually from Ukraine, which was a part of the Russian Empire at that point. Mm -hmm. But he wrote in in Russian. But my understanding from talking to my Russian lit grad uh, wife, Carrie, who's been on the show quite a few times, (laughs) is that although he wrote in Russian, he dropped a lot of Ukrainian words in there. So he kind of like enriched the the russian language and and russian and ukrainian are there's quite a bit of overlap mm-hmm. i mean i only am semi-competent in russian and i've done like geolingo ukrainian so <laughs> so uh but just doing that you kind of go okay i can kind of i can kind of see how these are branches of this of the same uh, the <laughs> sure. same tree as it were um and in terms of we itself i've only seen bits and pieces of it but notably it stars um or at least there's an important role for Natalia Vale who yes. folks who've been following this show will probably know her from uh, Prisoner of the Caucasus but 
you know, the roles that she plays in in that and then in V couldn't be more different. Although there's like kind of a comic dimension. I I find like V it's um it's a horror comedy film which mm. I think goes a little bit overlooked uh and it's just like such an energetic and unusual kind of performance that I I really enjoy it. Yeah, it it's I don't know whether campy is the is the right word, but from the bits that I've seen it is it's quite kind of um I mean, maybe overblown is the wrong word, but uh, also, but it, it, yeah, like you say, it is very energetic and kind of, kind of full on in a right, maybe sort of slightly Francis Ford Coppola Dracula kind of way, although clearly I, with I not nearly that. the budget that he <laughs> what, what it really he got to play with on that. That people might know is the Evil Dead films, maybe especially Evil Dead Two, that kind of mixing of the horror and comedy and the kind of outrageousness that goes along with that. <laughs> Mm, mm. yeah horror comedy is quite a hard one to do i mean i haven't horror is not a genre i've seen a a ton of Mm -hmm. but actually making it funny and kind of scary at the same time is is a tricky one i literally a few days ago finally got around to watching what we do in the shadows which uh, that's a lot of fun (laughs) yeah yeah um Anyway, <laughs> I feel like we've probably drifted uh, severely <laughs> off, off off topic, but you know that's kind of our, uh, our mo uh, over here. So yes, do apologise, listeners, if this is uh, your first time on the show. But this is pretty much par for the course. Um, but anyway, yeah, the film we're watching today was was actually one that you suggested that we do a little while back back and just you know my organizational skills were only just getting around to it but um but yeah so uh what was it that you thought we should watch today uh chapaev hurrah <laughs> <laughs> it should always come with a hurrah i feel like that's obligatory <laughs> <laughs> i think so it's a 1934 film and like for me growing up this was always kind of the russian film or what i thought of mm. as the russian film and i don't know if it really has that reputation outside of uh, Eastern Europe, I guess, but even before I'd ever seen the film, I sort of recognized the the image that you see on the posters of the character, the figure Chapayev pointing, and his uh, machine gunner Petka, like that that was so recognizable to me. Um, I, I guess it's iconic. But and last time we talked on the show, it was about uh, my friend Ivan Lapshin, which is set in the 1930s, and I sort of pictured that mm, of as course, being yeah. like. You know, the characters in that film could have gone and seen Chapayev in the movie theater. Uh, and I think. Do you know what? They almost certainly would have done yes. because from what I read, I did, I did actually a, a bit more preparation than usual. I managed to pick up Julian Graffy's book, literally just called Chapayev. And he quotes, I think like 30 million people had seen Chapayev within a year of the release of the film, which was late 1934. I think it was November. So, yeah. so it's uh, 85th anniversary is, it was within a couple of days of, uh, of this recording, although this will probably come out a bit later, mm-hmm. but uh, anyway, <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, it's interesting what you say about um, it being iconic. This was one that I'd somehow managed to completely miss hearing anything about in my you know five years living in russia it's 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 funny i think i wasn't watching as many films Mm -hmm. back then like prior to going out there i had a kind of big few years for watching a lot of films going to the cinema a lot and subsequently since i came back i've kind of got back into that again but i just didn't see that that much and it somehow didn't come up in conversation on the other hand, the the photo and the image of Chapayev looked kind of vaguely familiar when I got the book. So I'm kind of like, I'm sure I've seen this on on posters and you know merchandise and I mean, it's been referenced and parodied. And I like, I think in that uh, Julian Graffy book, there's like a photo of uh, I think maybe graffiti that's kind of stylized to copy that, or maybe it was on the Wikipedia site, like this Ukrainian. Uh, graffiti that's sort of an updated version of that image and you know it, it, it's all over it's just uh I, maybe it's the sort of thing that like you have to sort of know to look for it but <laughs> yes yeah. once once, once you, know you know what it, it is you see it everywhere yeah yeah and just yeah from reading the book it sounds like it is a film that maybe not necessarily at this point all russians have have seen but it's it's certainly very much one that's kind of in the in the popular consciousness it's it's seminal it's like i I think 
sort of the equivalent for uh, maybe American audiences or Western audience would be like some of these big John Wayne Westerns, like, you know, probably the actual number of people who have seen uh, Stagecoach isn't as great today as the number of people who just recognize the images from it. Or, you know, it's it's mm. that thing that kind of looms, you know, even today in the popular culture, even though it's uh, quite old. So I, I think like it's kind of the equivalent to, you know, maybe some of those big Westerns or <laughs> that kind of thing. Or, or even going back to the horror connection, something like the original Frankenstein with Boris Karloff sure. or the Bela Lugosi Dracula. I haven't seen either of those, mm -hmm. um, but, you know... Everyone, when they think of those two characters, probably the mental image they're they're getting is uh, is is from those. Right. You know, right. even though there have been you know a ton of subsequent adaptations, there's there's something about doing the first big version of of things. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, with Dracula, there was there was like a pseudo. It was the Nosferatu, which is the unlicensed. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and and I mean, some people may not may not know that there was basically a court order to destroy all the negatives mm. of of that because it was a breach of copyright. Which, like, thank goodness they didn't get all of them. <laughs> right. Yeah, I actually watched that and also the uh, Werner Herzog uh, remake oh, that's a really this good year remake. for the first yeah. time. Yeah, yeah, it's it's it, that's that's one of those things. I kind of think remakes, if it's you know, 50 plus years, or well, probably about 50 years at the time, that's kind of like, okay, fair, fair enough. Um, I mean, I'm not saying that, you know, in a couple of years, The Godfather is, you know, open season for that, but... <laughs> I, I think it depends, like, if you have something new to offer, or, uh, mm, you know, and sometimes yeah. it might be just because the technology's changed so much over time, or you have different actors to work with who might bring something different, or an auteur who has just a different vision. But um, the original Nosferatu still scares me, actually. Like, uh, I think because it's so old, something about the, you know, the scratched up old images has this kind of creepiness to it. Like, there's one shot of him just looking through the window across the street, and it, it still like gives me goosebumps and kind of freaks me out, <laughs> even today. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a it's a kind of a different kind of scariness mm -hmm. to kind of like, you know, oh, suddenly someone's appearing with a knife. <laughs> sure. You know, the jump scare model. It's much more of an insidious kind of like, Ugh, you the, know, the, like the Nosferatu creature just looks wrong. Like I always think, um, especially that version compared to some of the other interpretations of the Dracula character. Like Nosferatu is this thing that's not a human being that's just impersonating a human being so it can eat us and it just gets into that uncanny valley territory and it's such a good kind of physical performance how awkward he is and how like mm. wrong he looks <laughs> i really like it yeah yeah uh, well and and going back to uh what we do in the shadows i love that they essentially went yeah we're just doing the nosferatu <laughs> vampire <laughs> Yeah, except he's called except he's called Peter. <laughs> and the way they talk about him, like he's just one of the guys, but it's this like terrifying thing in a coffin in the basement. <laughs> yeah, whereas the rest of them are semi normal ish dudes who happen to be vampires. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's actually a slightly, uh, you know, we're doing all the connections here today, but there's something about their flat that's very with Nell and I. Yeah, uh, it's except true. it's yeah. <laughs> I should do it. Just should should do a side by side of that. Actually, <laughs> of, the, that would be cool. of the sink, right? <laughs> That's probably the main thing, to be honest. But yeah, um, yeah. I actually, before we we crack on with with the film, I wanted to talk a little bit about nineteen thirties movies in general. I mean, we kind of name dropped the original Frankenstein mm -hmm. and and Dracula just kind of in in passing, but it's it's a decade where I've not actually seen that much from there and and actually knowing that i was going to be doing this at some point made me think you know what i should actually see see a few more but i yeah i'd be really interested in hearing your like 1930s highlights oh sure uh sorry <laughs> putting you on the spot yeah i mean some of the classic hollywood stuff that was being made at that time was i love uh the thin man's uh you know 1930s film from classic hollywood i really love or like you know you think about stuff like king kong the grand spectacle of it and just how fast paced that was like really the hollywood films i i think from that period were some of the best actually and it especially early 1930s films it's kind of interesting to see that transition from 
silent to the sound area, how, like, it could be a little bit awkward at times. Uh, and, you know, because Soviet Union was a little bit behind mm. technically, uh, it lagged a little bit in that transition. So I know uh, Chapayev was almost a silent film. Yeah, I was going to mention that, actually. that Apparently the, the directors, uh, Georgi and Sergei Vasilyev, supposedly the Vasilyev brothers, that's how they were captioned, who aren't actually brothers? <laughs> who aren't actually can, brothers? <laughs> and if you can read, if you're if you're familiar with like Russian uh, naming conventions, and you saw their full names, you'd be like, "Wait a minute, you're not brothers because you don't have the same patronymic." Yeah, um, but right, the, the middle name it's not not, not the, the same. same as you can tell not the same not dad. The same I mean, I guess fathers. you could. I guess you <laughs> yeah. you could you could obviously yeah. be half half brothers. Um, but that doesn't go quite so well on the on the you know the title card. That but they would, then you would have a, probably a different last name. But well, yeah, the, the, that's the whole true. story about him, um, I forget w- which one it was, but like reading this magazine article <laughs> in the Soviet film magazine and being yeah. like, "Huh, that's not me." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. But uh, I, I suppose it goes to show that you know. Uh, even in the Soviet Union, they had like instincts for marketing things, and they just went. Yes. Do you know what? They're both called Vasiliev, so let's make them the Vasiliev brothers. There's something very like vaudeville about that. Like I always mm. have to check when I hear these like famous acts. Like, were the Marx brothers really brothers? Okay, they were really. Okay, just just checking. Like, <laughs> yeah. Well, they don't even. Hear... They don't even particularly look all that similar. <laughs> I mean, no. not that siblings always have to look super similar. Um, but, uh, yeah. But I feel like, especially, like, back then, it was, like, almost like a marketing thing or branding thing. If you were doing, like, a, you know, two or more person act, you would be, like, oh, the whatever brothers or the whatever sisters. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think you can still see in the film, like, I think there was also, like, a silent version edited because, like, a lot of theaters weren't equipped for sound at that point quite yet. And, like, it still has these intertitles, which are kind of weird. Mm. Where it's, it's, like, still feels um, similar to something you'd see in the silent film. You know, the village has been captured, like, a big title that comes up in the middle of the film. So it's kind of right on that line, yeah. Which, in some in some ways, is perhaps less awkward sometimes, depending on how it's done, than having like a basil exposition moment it's sometimes mm-hmm. just much cleaner to just a sticker or or even just having a, or having a voiceover it's it's just a, an extra tool in the toolkit and because you know they were so close to that being the way you ha- sort of had to do things it was probably just more at the tip of people's brain as like yeah we can just use this whereas i think much more recent filmmakers it wouldn't necessarily occur to them that it's an okay thing to do but yeah, it can be pretty efficient. Although I I remember hearing on um, Adam Roche's podcast, Secret History of Hollywood, one of the things that Hitchcock tried to do and was really inspired by German impressionist, uh, expressionist, sorry, <laughs> mixing my terminology, <laughs> whichever one of those it was. The, the, the uh, expressionist, yeah. Uh, the German filmmakers, and they one of the things he noticed that they did was that they were really sparing with with the title cards and he had a feeling that the more title cards you do if you if you have a lot then it's a sign that you're not really doing the visual story storytelling properly right it, it could be a sort of a crutch the way that you know heavy exposition is a crutch in a lot of films today i think films that have very strong visual storytelling you don't really need to have anything explained to you you just pick it up as you watch and that's you know, I mean, every film's different, and uh, you know, there, there's a place for my dinner with Andre and that sort of thing too. But I, I think just you know, in general, the idea of uh, strong visual storytelling it it means less text, less speaking, because the film it's a visual mm, medium. Yeah, and you you might as well play to that, play to its right. strengths. Yeah, yeah. I was, I'm gonna just kind of drop a few '30s films that I've watched watched recently that I that I really liked, probably first and foremost uh, would be old dark house i was really surprised oh, by that that's really great yeah i, I like that one a lot and just too. like on paper it it sounds kind of corny but it works really well i was just just sort of like semi re-watching it last night they use a lot of thunderclaps and a lot of like whistling wind and yeah like i say on paper that sounds super corny but they're 
committed enough to it that it just works well as part of the sound design and just is unsettling. Um, right. Yeah, I don't know why it's effective because it sounds like it would be cheesy, but it it kind of works. No, no, like James Well, I think is a really great director. He also did uh, Frankenstein and Bride of Frankenstein yeah. and The Invisible Man, and like he has such a strong sense of style. I think compared to some of his other contemporary filmmakers, um, have you seen the film uh, Gods and Monsters with Ian McKellen? As no, James I well? haven't, but I've heard I've heard that it's good and it's good. Yeah, yeah, I definitely want to check out those two Frankenstein films and other things that he's that he's done because I was I was just really really impressed i'd I'd heard about it for a while but i'd only just got around to watching it and mm -hmm. yeah i mean there's some really very very striking visual stuff i mean the way that a lot of the characters look and you know there's again horror horror comedy it, it is it is a funny film but it right. is also properly creepy <laughs> right and then um also 30s films i think the the one i first saw and have it's probably one of the films I've seen the most times in my life would be the uh, the Errol Flynn Robin Hood. Okay. You know, I yep. I was a kid back at the time where you'd record films on VHS off the TV and then you could just play them and play them and I must have seen that film so many times. And you know, I didn't really know who Errol Flynn was, I didn't know who Bar Basil Rathbone was, I didn't know who Claude Rains was, but yeah, so many, so many great actors, and it's it's big, it's hammy, but it is it is so much fun. I it's it's almost one I was kind of like want to rewatch ev every year just because it's so entertaining. Right. I, I I'm trying to cycle through like just in my mind what are some of the 1930s films like that I really like or that I can think of. I mean, some of the early Hitchcock stuff like 39 Steps is great. Um Yeah, not seen that one, but I have seen the first version of The Man Who Knew Too Much. Oh yeah. And I liked the comic sensibility in that as well. I thought the the husband and wife had a really kind of touching and funny it's just a great compact little film and then um of course you've got like Peter Laurie in that, so I think I'm right in saying that that was one of his first English language roles. I think and that he... was his first English language role because before that, I think the only English he had done was like an English dubbed version, or not dubbed, but um, when they filmed M, they would film like different versions for different markets. So he would just redo the scene again in English, or I think maybe also in French. Uh, so there's like different versions. If you go and look at, uh, maybe it's on the M DVD that there's like clips from these alternate versions. Since I don't like when you're making a silent film, it's easy to just swap out the oh, originals. Yeah. <laughs> but when you're doing a language, like some of the early sound films before they had dubbing, they would just like film three different versions of each scene or five different versions. Mm, and the mm. actors would have to perform in different languages. Or, or, um, or you, I, th I think with, with the Bella Lugosi Dracula, they had different actors shoot on the same sets in Spanish. I, I think I read right, recently. Yeah. Or, um, I think maybe it was a different cast. Like they, they would come in at night and just film on the same sets. And like, I, yeah. I don't think I've ever actually seen that version. I've had it like sitting on the, and, and I know some people actually consider that to be the superior version. But, hmm, so I yeah. should get around to seeing it sooner or later. But I, I know it's like with the, the collection, the, the Blu-ray, it's just, I haven't actually sat down to watch it. Uh, another even... 1930s film. Oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I just thought, as we'd mentioned it already, the uh, the Werner Herzog Nosferatu. They did two versions of that, I think. And I uh, the the version I watched was the English language version, and I've heard that the German version is is better, just because people's performances are a bit more natural because right. they're speaking languages. Then, or more. in the case of Kinski, uh, more unnatural. <laughs> I don't know. Wow. Well, uh, yeah, that's <laughs> that's tr that's true. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, a film I really like is uh, Young Mr. Lincoln by oh, okay. uh, John Ford. And I, I was just reading the other day that um, Eisenstein really loved the film. Mm. And it was a big inspiration for him in making the um, Ivan the Terrible movies, That's so which I, I never would have guessed when I, you know, if you had just seen the two on their own, mm. I don't know if you necessarily would have expected there to be a connection but now i want to go back and rewatch them both together just to see if i can find any similarities yeah john ford's a bit of a, a bit of a blind spot in terms of stuff i've i've seen but i have seen uh in fact we covered it for on here yeah the, mm -hmm. i've seen the first bit of uh of ivan the terrible I haven't haven't got got around to 
seeing part two. And again, returning to a, a, a thread from earlier in the conversation, that definitely, even though it was the 40s, I, I found that quite a hard film to get on with because it did it did feel very much like a director who was much more comfortable doing silent films being yeah. forced to do it with sound. I mean, it's visually great, but it's also, there's quite a bit of kind of clunkiness, so... I, I agree. I, I think I think that's exactly right. I mean, we're going to get into Chapayev in a minute, but I kind of prefer, you know, what they're doing as opposed to what I, Eisenstein was doing from around the same time. Like, I think that very sort of stylized, big dramatic performance kind of thing, like, just, you know, never really worked for me with the mm. Ivan the Terrible films or, you know... I mean, like you said, visually very impressive. And I think like Eisenstein, his contributions maybe have more to do with his um, theorizing and stuff like that. And that's kind of why he's taught in a lot of like Western film schools. Like, I, I think I was telling you before, it was like every single film class I ever had, they had to show <laughs> Battleship Potemkin or yeah. the, the, the step sequence, uh, you know, just on its own. Like that was considered to be so important and you get a little bit sick of it after a while. <laughs> so that actually kind of like turned me off of uh, Eisenstein for a while. But I, I can still appreciate like, you know, his ideas and his uh, career. It's just not really for me, I found <laughs> Yeah, um, speaking of him, the first podcast appearance I ever did, I guested on a podcast called Classic Schmassic, which is uh, sadly no longer with us, but if you have CastBox, all 50 episodes are still on there, so uh, that's definitely worth digging up. And the uh, their rating system was Classic if it lived up to the hype and Schmassic <laughs> if it didn't, and right. one of the hosts gave Battleship Pachomkin Schmassic, except for the step sequence which he okay. gave a classic <laughs> uh which you know is fair it's it's very impressive but uh mm -hmm. yeah yeah there's there's a kind of hamminess to some of the some of the other bits um actually that was going to be one of the questions i wanted to ask you as someone who's already seen chapayev is how bash you over the head with propaganda is it in comparison to Battleship Potemkin, because that is one of those films where it really wears its message, you know, yeah. on both sleeves, emblazoned on front and back of its jersey, and, you know, down both legs for good measure. It's kind of like, hey, <laughs> communism, good. Everything else, not good. Um, I'd say not quite as bash you over the head. I mean, you never quite forget that you're watching a propaganda film, a sort of myth-making mm. film, but I think, like... Again, comparing it to these American Westerns, like those were also about sort of myth-making and uh, mythic figures. And I think, like, for me, Chef, I have, you know, it's sort of like, yeah, I get there's a message there. It's propaganda. It's sort of blatantly propaganda. But it's also, like, entertaining and charming. And, you know, it, it sort of doesn't bother me as much that it's propaganda because there are films that come along later and kind of take a revisionist approach or kind of critical approach to what it's saying. And, like... I don't know, that defangs it a little bit, mm. I find, in the same way that, like, you know, again, c comparing it to these Westerns, I think of, you know, films like Dead Man or some of the revisionist Westerns that came, like, in the 70s or later that took a critical eye to that, you know, classic Hollywood Western myth-making that, you know, maybe these messages aren't actually <laughs> good, <laughs> what, what's being promoted. Or, you know, even, like, uh, John Ford himself, I, I think, with The Searchers, he kind of started deconstructing the, the kind of inherent racism that's mm. in a lot of the earlier Westerns and, uh, you know, that you can kind of tie directly to John Wayne as an icon, especially <laughs> these days. But um, Yeah, and, and the thing is, I mean, you should be watching films with a critical eye anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, you shouldn't just go, whatever's in this is absolutely 100% historically accurate you know right even I mean, even if yeah <laughs> directors aren't deliberately trying to to pull the wool out over your eyes or have you know conscious sort of bad intentions but uh yeah i think just with anything you you kind of have to use your brain because that's what your brain's there for right I, I think that's a good attitude and i think it's also possible to watch something that like yeah i disagree with the message or i you know disagree with the film's ideology but mm. at the same time i can appreciate how it says it and find it interesting and kind of 
you know, take that approach instead of dismissing it outright, you know. Or, I, I think, like, with a film like Chapayev, there's obviously a lot to talk about and there's a lot to dig into, um, you know. So, like, just kind of writing it off as propaganda, it's a little bit like, uh, you know, I, I think, like, there's actually something to get out of it. Yeah, and I, th- I think there is a conversation to be had about financially supporting films where it's clear that there's something kind of ideologically underhand or just you know it's a it's a I tricky mean, it, one it's a little bit different when you're talking about like a 1930s film oh that's yeah part of a exactly failed yeah. state <laughs> but um it, you know like it, uh, sort of a more recent example i can think of that i think relates to what you're saying is the film uh hero the Zhang Yimou mm, yeah big epic film production hero which has like a really nationalistic kind of message going on yeah and, authoritarian you know, it, it's sort of yeah it's authoritarian good that this and... <laughs> guy crushed everyone <laughs> <laughs> and you know at the same time like you know that's probably one of the best films i've ever seen in a movie theater like you know in in sort of recent years or since it was released but mm. oh i would have know, loved like, to have seen that on a big screen oh my like, it, it's gorgeous it's like beautifully acted beautifully performed how it says this like terrifying horrible message is really <laughs> elegant and beautiful you know so yeah like, it, it can kind of make you feel uh, complicated and it keep mm. it like that's sometimes i don't know like problematic films i feel like that make you wrestle with things are almost more interesting than films where it's like oh that was good and i like the message and i'm gonna move on with my life you know there's sort of a lack of closure that comes with these films where it's like uh, i don't know how to feel about this that might actually keep me coming back i don't know Mm -hmm. yeah i think there's there's something to be said for being able to say okay this this is really effective storytelling maybe the story it's telling is as you say problematic but there's still <laughs> stuff you can learn from and and that me- at least it's you know it starts a conversation i guess you can say mm-hmm. well you know actually this isn't quite the only interpretation of say chinese history or you know sure i i think it just takes that critical eye and sort of like be prepared to kind of inform yourself with the you know a little bit of research a little bit of context and kind mm. of you know if you're going to dig in make sure you have the the plastic medical gloves on you know it's it's a little bit like you know watching something like a triumph of the will or whatever it, it's oh like, my goodness yeah, yeah this is important this is terrible propaganda that supported this regime but it's also like a very influential film and uh you know it, it's like okay you know I, I think it's better to get something out of this but you do have to have that critical eye and be very yeah. wary and you know I, I think like you know watch it responsibly is maybe the best way to describe it i feel like yeah i bet that's a, that's just generally a good way to, to <laughs> right. live your life i mean i i kind of feel like we should move on to the film but it, it just yep. in, in passing as i think it's kind of uh germane to the conversation um have you seen oh I, I was gonna say the original version of the four feathers but it's not the original version because that, the, that story the got 1930s made a whole version yeah like the, the 1939 the yeah, yes. yeah yes yeah i had a very similar feeling about that the mm-hmm. couple of times i've watched it is that there's there's some great visual stuff and there's some there's some really fun performance stuff and i mean it even does kind of send up british imperial attitudes somewhat but it also kind of says that they're sort of okay at the same time, which is kind of gross and icky. But it's, you know, again, it's, I would say it's worth watching. I mean, it's definitely better than like putting your blinders onto these things and just not trying to understand the history and like how that history was represented on film and all the things that sort of go along with that. I, I always think it's better to know and to struggle with this stuff and to just kind of block it out and pretend it doesn't exist but. yeah although i guess the one caveat i would say is is that perhaps if you're more directly affected by those issues mm-hmm. knowing it ahead of time so if it's something that would potentially be be painful you know going going in and not being blindsided by something like that yes yeah. i mean it's tricky because sometimes you want to watch a film and not have it be spoiled you just kind of want to go in with a complete sort of blank slate and maybe <laughs> you know the poster image that said probably the poster image uh, for uh, the four feathers would give you an idea that mm, maybe this is a little right. racist um but uh yeah uh, it's 
it's a tricky it's a tricky balance and i feel that's a that's a cop out but yeah no, no context is important and it, it's sort of you don't want to spring stuff on people necessarily no. but yeah or I, like i don't know again like thinking back to like especially a lot of these 1930s hollywood films they can be so racist, like mind-bogglingly racist. Yeah, it comes um, out and it just like slaps you in the face with it. And you're like, oh god. Like, um, <laughs> I want to say, is it um, High Sierra? The um, it's a Humphrey Bogart film. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. There's a black character in that, and it's just like, oh my goodness, the fact that you wrote this character in there and then you made a black actor act this part. It's it's so demeaning. I feel so mm-hmm. sorry for that guy. I'm afraid I don't even remember what the name of the actor is. But yeah, I I just it just kind of it made me angry just watching yes. that bit. And, and a lot of the times, it's, it's in these a films good that film. seems so harmless too. At the same time, it's like mm. you're watching this film that like otherwise it's a like a boring rom com or something like that, and then it comes out of nowhere, and you're like, oh right, that's that was america back then well um and breakfast at tiffany's for example that's like 19 yeah, what, 1960 yeah. 1961 and that's just like the hideous mickey rooney like yellow face and it's just like yeah. whoa yeah. <laughs> why was yeah. this why was this thought of as okay Ugh. <laughs> I, we keep getting off topic i'm sorry <laughs> <laughs> it's all right i keep doing this <laughs> Just just draw a line under it. Racism is bad, and we, we should. <laughs> <laughs> Filmmakers, stop doing racism. <laughs> Check. All right, I'm glad we've cleared right. that up. <laughs> right, so uh, so uh, on to, on to the film. So this is uh, the point where we say a a word of Russian, and that word of Russian is "payekhli," which means "off we go." So three, two, one, "payekhli." And we're back. Martin and I have just watched Chapayev by the uh, Vasiliev supposed brothers. (laughs) And before we let you know what we thought of it uh we're just going to go over to martin for a brief summary of the plot as always spoiler warnings in effect i mean this is about a historical figure admittedly somewhat obscure in the west but it's kind of like known what happens but still if you don't know the story and don't want to know before you watch the film this is the time to you know go and watch the film all right with that out of the way over to you martin sure um the film, it's about the real Red Army commander, Vasily Chapayev, who uh, fought against the Czechoslovak Legion and the White Army during the Civil War. And it's uh, following his exploits with, I guess, his his trusty sidekick, uh, Petka, and Petka's love interest, uh, Anna or Anka, I think, depending which version you watch. And... Uh, also, another major character is um, Commissar Fermanov, who is a fictionalized version of the author of the novel that the film, it's, I guess, not officially based on, but the novel was sort of a phenomenon in its own right. So the film is kind of based on it, except not really, because they went back to the journals and sort of uh, wrote it from scratch. There, there's not that many scenes that translate from the book to the film. And um, there's lots of action, there's drama, and uh, I don't know if I should spoil the ending right here or if that's okay with you. Well, put it put it this way. Okay, <laughs> so last spoiler warning out the way. Uh, Chapayev's dates are uh, 1887 to 1919, which is the year that the film is set. So that, you know... That pretty much tells you what the ending is. Right. Um, He goes out in uh, pretty exciting fashion, machine gunning, he's wounded, and then he's uh, crossing the river and is shot and drowns or is killed while uh, in the river. So that's that's what happens to Chapayev. But um, yeah, that's the the film, I guess, basically, (laughs) in broad strokes. 
Um, yeah, you, you've kind of got a a setup where we we spend most of our time with with the Reds, but we also get to know the Whites uh, a little bit as well, and it kind of <laughs> the villainous Whites twirling yes. their mustaches. <laughs> Although Chapayev's mustache has to be one of the, like the great cinematic mustaches, it's it's, it's a pretty it's good mustache. Truly, a, truly a thing of a thing of wonder. Um, <laughs> I like uh, the whites go marching into battle with uh, cigars. That, like, the the mm. commanders are chomping on cigars while they're marching in, and yeah. there's those big banners with the skulls on them. Like, oh yeah, uh, I don't know. Have you seen uh, the the Mitchell and Webb sketch? Oh, of course. Yeah. Oh, we, <laughs> are the, we baddies? the baddies. baddies? <laughs> yeah, That's yeah. I, I have to say that did that did spring to mind. I must say. <laughs> Uh, and 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 also, yeah. I mean, I knew that the uh, Czechoslovak Legion was involved in this civil war, but I didn't know specifically that they sort of like they don't even really appear. They're they're kind of like at the very beginning of the film. <laughs> they run away pretty quick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I just I I just thought that it's really funny that I'm talking uh, to a <laughs> a guy of, of of Czech origin about this film. <laughs> And it just starts off with just, you know, making making it clear that, you know, the Czechs are the bad guys. I mean, they're sure. not the bad guys in this film, but they're bad and you shouldn't like them. No. <laughs> well, uh, I think the Czechoslovak Legion, it might have even had been formed before Czechoslovakia was a country. Like it mm. was, I think, formed early on. And basically they were sent in to try to, you know, support the Tsarists and for a while they did okay, and I think they sort of dissipated <laughs> to, towards the end of the war when uh, things became clear. But I, I think at one point they were only like two days away from actually rescuing the Tsar of their family, so they <laughs> they didn't make it on time for that. But, you know, they were there and they were doing things, so it, it was just kind of neat yeah. for me to see it in the opening scene with them <laughs> kind of running for their lives. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and, and of course the... Um... The Tsar and his family were in Yekaterinburg when they were executed. So the Czechs were like, they were a long way from home because yeah. that's, it's properly in Siberia. I mean, it's not like all the way across, but it's all, you're not in European Russia at that point. I'm no. pretty, sh I'm pretty sure it's the, it's the other side of the Urals. So <laughs> yeah, they must have been like, why are we here again? Oh yeah. <laughs> communism bad. <laughs> right. <laughs> Oh man! So yeah, so we've got got the checks out the way, <laughs> seen them off. Um. <laughs> well, and I think the film it's paced very well as far as like you know, quick action scene at the beginning, character growth, the relationships, some like little drama, big kind of triumphant action scene, then um, denouement with the tragic action scene. <laughs> like yeah, you know, for an hour and a half film, like I think it really moves. Like the um, <laughs> the the uh, Vasilia brothers, I, they started off as editors, right? Yes, I had read that. So, yeah, you can definitely tell that they know how to pace a film. You know, it really moves, actually, for an hour and a half film. Like, I think some people have this idea that older films are all very slow and kind of dreary and, uh, I guess, even boring compared to, like, films today. But, mm. you know, if you've ever seen, like, a three-hour-long Transformer film, <laughs> you know that <laughs> I've, not... I've kind of deliberately avoided putting myself through right. that. <laughs> you know, but I, I think people sort of forget, like, a film from 1934 can be uh, exciting and fast-paced, and mm. I, I think I, I consider this entertaining, so... Oh, definitely. I mean, the action is definitely weighted towards the last half hour for the most part yeah as you said but the good thing about that is you do care about the characters because they have spent the time building them up and that's that's so key to making a making a movie where you actually care about people like also like the the way the characters are developed one thing that kind of impresses me is that chapayev is not portrayed as this like sort of boring stoic hero he's actually kind mm. of a flawed character <laughs> you oh, know yeah. he, he doesn't always yeah. do the right thing and like um of course you know it's modified from when you read about the real chapayev like mm. you know but i think as a character for this film i i find it really likable <laughs> you know actually makes mistakes and uh he's he's got a bit of an ego like there he, is he a bit where <laughs> Where he literally, almost literally does the, do you know who I am thing, which yes. 
is normally not the most ingratiating <laughs> thing, but... Uh... But he has this sort of melancholy side too. Like, he almost comes across, uh, maybe not like manic depressive, but he has these like big bouts of energy and then he's kind of like sad singing on the floor and thinking about the future and that sort of thing. And, mm. uh, and you know, he does some questionable things. Like, I think when he shoots the deserters, it's, uh, it's sort of meant to be like justified within the context of how the film is portrayed although oh, like, I think yeah. today it feels like it's it's a real failing of the character like uh, the book gets into a little bit about that um you know they, they sort of point out that you know up till that point chapayev had always used his charisma and his sort of natural character to kind of sway people and at that point mm. he's using violence and it feels it's just making you know, like an a, example of like if you don't want to be like them then you better you know drop into yeah. line yeah, you know, so it feels like, like to me, that actually plays interesting because it feels like a failing of the character. Um, but I think, like at the time, it would have been seen as like, oh yeah, Chapayev is doing it, so it's okay to kill whoever doesn't go along. Yeah, with it. and they totally deserved it. Yeah, I thought it was interesting that the like the most summary quote unquote justice is is meted out against you know traitors and and deserters. I was kind of like. Hmm. No wonder Stalin loved this film so much. <laughs> right. Actually, about that, like I, I read that he that within two years of this coming out, he'd watched it thirty eight times, and he watched it eleven <laughs> times in about two the initial two weeks. Right. So the guy was obsessed with this film. I mean, and that's I, it was so much weird. His film, like he, yeah, he loved this, and he loved uh, John Wayne westerns. <laughs> like that's what Stalin liked to watch. So. Yeah, and he heavily involved himself in the Soviet film industry to mm -hmm. the point that he kind of like accidentally kind of it. <laughs> strangled it. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. mean, <laughs> and it wasn't because he deliberately wanted to do that. It's just that everyone was so freaking scared, and his mm -hmm. standards were so like high uh, but at the same time very difficult to pin down from what i understand that just people were really scared of making a mistake and it was also really difficult to find anyone to make films because they really weren't willing to take a chance on somebody who who hadn't you know proved themselves already there's an episode of uh sean guillory's sean's russia blog podcast mm -hmm. where maria bella dubrovskaya uh, talked to talked to him about the stalinist film industry it's really fascinating but just like right. oh my goodness know, you know like, if you've ever had trouble at life, work like there were so few films actually being made you know mm. it's looking like it's kind of shocking to see like you know, you think Soviet film, they must be producing so many films, but it's like, oh, th this year they only made five movies total? Like, <laughs> it's kind of shocking. Yeah, it's kind of like you've got all of the resources of the state at your disposal, and that's not really making, <laughs> that's not really counting for very much. Mm -hmm. And, like, there was always red tape to go through. I know mm. Chapai of the film, uh, it took almost a decade to get made. Like, they, they started making it, well, um, uh, Fermanov was still alive. He actually wrote the first draft. Yeah, because he died. He died quite young. Yeah, and his draft, I think, was rejected. Um, I, <laughs> I haven't actually read the novel, but like a couple people kind of mentioned that it's sort of rough around the edges. Like mm. maybe he wasn't the best writer, even though it was very popular. T tell you, tell you what. Um, I was hoping you might mention that just because. Um, <laughs> the The writer Maxim Gorky gave him some feedback, and it is a. And I've got the I've got the book here, okay. and it's a sick, sick burn. So, <laughs> so thank right. you for giving me the opportunity. So, uh, so quote: um, I don't think I have to explain to you the enormous significance of form in art. Its decisive significance. Every carpenter, when making a chair, is concerned that his chair should not turn out looking like a cupboard or a chest of drawers. Unquote. <laughs> That's pretty great. <laughs> yeah, it's it's just like I mean, yeah. Gorky dropping the literary burns, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Back in your place, upstart. Well, from what I was reading, it almost sounded like his journals were more interesting than the book itself because like mm. he did kind of censor a lot and I mean, there's one big thing I we could talk about that kind of got removed from both the book and also the film that yeah absolutely he kind of played around with but um his wife uh who was called anna 
<laughs> right. Uh, she, she wrote the second draft of the screenplay, but um, I mean, she was there with him when he was assigned to follow uh, Chapayev as the commissar. And I guess during that time... Yeah, we should probably <laughs> explain for anyone who hasn't watched the film and then and therefore hasn't picked it up from watching the film what a commissar is. It's like um, a political officer sort of help make sure that these maybe partisan groups are kind of... Uh, or even regular regular army. Or even army. just regular Red Army, you know, fell in with the political Goals. line. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to, to, you know, b- make sure they behaved, yeah. Yeah, it seems like the worst thing that you can imagine right. <laughs> as a as a military officer, like, trying to get a job done. You have someone basically, like, backseat driving your uh, your decisions. So, I mean, the the... The communists are kind of famous for this, but it, I think it dates back to the um, the French Revolution. They had like representatives on mission who were very similar, and they were always like, "Nope, <laughs> you can't and, do that. That's well, that's not the what film we want." Portrays him very positively. Like he's almost like a paternalistic figure for Chapayev. He kind of like guides him when he's, you know, maybe going off course, letting his men uh, loot the peasants and stuff like yeah. that, which is is uh, you know definitely cleaning up how things actually were between them. But, mm. you know, if you see a film like um, Trial on the Road by Alexei Garman, which is set during the Second World War, like the political officer is portrayed much less favorably. He's a very <laughs> human character, but at the same time, he's like... A, a bit more true to life. Yeah, a bit maybe. more true to life, I, I would say. Like, you know, this uh, the relationship between Fermanov and Chapayev in the film is very idealized. And it's sort of like, you know, even though... There's some friction between them at first, and he's like, he doesn't really like him. It's like, okay, you might not like the political officer at there at first, but he's there to help. And like, you know, there's some tension between them when he's like, okay, who's who's the boss? You or me? And he's like, you and me. Yeah, yeah. But there's, <laughs> yeah, there's almost like a sort of like buddy cop comedy dynamic yeah. to it where they initially right, meet, right. they're very different. They have different styles of working. They don't really like each other, but they kind of grow to develop a grudging respect by the end it's like exactly it's yeah. so it's so much like that although of course because it's 1934 that i don't i guess that uh that trope didn't really exist at that point but it is really funny watching it <laughs> sort of through that lens <laughs> no it's true i mean there's a lot of action movie tropes actually in this and i don't know if like, I, I assume it must have been influential for mm people outside of russia as well like i you know i sort of wonder if uh guys like sergio leone making the italian spaghetti westerns would have seen this or if akira kurosawa would have seen this i was gonna say kurosawa some of the cha- the cavalry charging stuff was just like this looks like it's right out of seven samurai yeah like i have no idea if he was, would have seen it but it seems so kind of familiar and like it, it made me think of that like that especially that sort of approach to realism and how the action's shot like i i would be shocked if he hadn't seen it actually Mm. yeah the only thing i wondered is just like i know pre-second world war japan was super like we really 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 don't like the communists yeah really what right wing so it might have been difficult to get a hold of i don't know um but who knows? I think, like, that's always true for, like, the general public when there's a clampdown. But, like, for people who are into film, like, they always kind of find ways around it. Like, even the Vasilia brothers, like, I was reading somewhere, they had, um, it might have been in the book, actually, that mm. they had a job censoring films and re-editing, like, Western films for Russian audiences, which means they were watching Western films, you know, so... I think that was in the book, because that sounds yeah. very familiar. Right, so, you know, like, I, I think if you're into film and you're making films, like, you do kind of find a way to see what's out there and sniff things out, even if, like, officially you're, you know, the general public doesn't really have access to it. Yeah, yeah they're not playing on the, in the, uh, in the cinema on the, on the, on the corner. Yeah, yeah, you kind of know people and, <laughs> yeah... <laughs> Have ways of getting getting hold of stuff. Oh, uh, yeah, that's that's interesting. Um, uh, about your your aliens comparison, I thought there was, <laughs> um, there was some stuff which may maybe J- James Cameron had uh, had had seen this, but there was some of the stuff with like the machine guns and the bullets and like mm, we've got a very limited supply that right. was that did remind me me of that. I mean, I think if it, I had, I mean, it could be coincidental, but it's just like I th- I think those kinds of action tropes seeing them being formed for the first time and uh, yeah 
it's sort of like compared to a lot of other kind of adventure films from around the time period, like this feels maybe more close. Like it feels close to the sensibilities of like later action films that I'm more familiar with, if that makes sense. Yeah. I mean, I, I was surprised by how well paced it was. Like, like you mentioned, you know, one does tend to have prejudices about what a 1930s film is going to it's going to be like and what sort of limitations they're going to be working with i was really impressed with this visually i mean yeah there's quite a lot of scenes which are people standing around in 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 rooms but the when they do actually get outside it's you know it's big groups of people moving around in formation and just knowing that that's real people and not cgi makes it so much more impressive and it's shot it's this great blend of like a more realistic approach than something like Battleship with Temkin, but it's also very dynamic at the same time. And I always associate that kind of exciting, dynamic sort of uh, photography with uh, Soviet cinema. You know, it, it definitely lives up to that. The angles they choose, the close ups on faces. There's still like a little bit of the silent movie acting that we were talking about, like towards the end when like the. You know that the white Cossacks are coming in, and Anka's like making these faces, like "Oh no!" And then, uh, yeah, Shapayev comes to the rescue, and it's like the hurrah phase. Like that feels very silent movie-ish, but for the most part, I, I think it feels pretty. I don't know, like pretty fresh for the time period. Mm. And and the montage in that in that big sequence where you do have all these like really s- smart, fearsome-looking white army soldiers <laughs> approaching the machine gun positions, and and just the way the sound is used, and and the and the montaging back and forth between the folks manning the well, I say manning the machine guns. You've got mm-hmm. Anker is is there on one of the machine guns as uh, as well. So yeah, and the way it's just cutting back and forth between them advancing, it's kind of like that seems you know advanced and yeah. i mean yes <laughs> eisenstein was was doing that sort of thing with the step sequence so it's it's not that unprecedented but it's still it looks really good and is really effective i feel like it, you know it sort of takes what eisenstein was doing with that step sequence and it's like okay we're gonna tone it back and make it a little bit more subtle and make it more accessible i, I think for a wide audience that's sort of part of the reason why i think the film is such a huge hit it kind of takes those techniques and it makes it you know, it, it just takes a very simple approach to it, and you know, it doesn't feel that experimental, really. Like, you know, it, it feels uh, polished for what it is. Mm. Yeah, um, going back to the kind of tropey stuff, I think this is the earliest film that I've seen where you have a character operating a machine gun and you're getting like the muzzle flashes like reflected on their face i was kind of like i was like wow i did not expect to see that in this <laughs> right oh the, the machine gun scenes are so cool <laughs> <laughs> yeah on the one hand it's a machine gun it's a you know right. <laughs> a nasty death dealing contraption but yeah years of watching action films has programmed <laughs> one to be like cool <laughs> <laughs> that's that's what i feel when i watch it <laughs> i know it's like juvenile but i'm like oh wow <laughs> yeah yeah there, there's 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 a t- teenage boy <laughs> sort of it's somewhere in, it's still yeah um yeah i was i was impressed and and some of the um some of the landscape stuff was 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 really atmospheric i thought like um the the scene where pietka goes out on his scouting mission and he's uh, saying goodbye to to anka and you just see him kind of like leaving you know over the hill and it, the sun setting and you've got yeah. all these silhouettes it's like that just that just looks good that doesn't yeah. look good for the time it just looks great a lot of beautiful images in it uh... I also find uh, there's a lot of humor in it that not that many people talk about when they discuss the film or, you know, you don't see it mentioned a lot. But like, especially in the first half, I'd say there's there's quite a few jokes sort of sprinkled in just to kind of lighten things up. And yeah, yeah, yeah. (laughs) And and the stuff with the with the potatoes where Chapayev is (laughs) is kind of showing the the eye position. And that actually reminded me a little bit of uh, of the four feathers where in in a very different context. But uh, when you've got like this old general uh, talking, you know, telling his war stories about the Crimean War, and he's kind of moving all this stuff on the dinner table around. And it's, it's (laughs) kind of like that, except, you know, the 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 trappings couldn't be more different. (laughs) But uh, right. 
Yeah. Like, it's also, like, you know, it helps you understand that, like, Chapayev, he's maybe not really strategically minded. Um, in real life, they said he wasn't really interested in theory or strategy. Like, he was, you know, lover of adventure more than uh, anything else. Yeah, and, and uh, kind of fortune and glory. Yeah, and, he, like, I think they said he got sent off to the military academy and he basically asked like hey send me back like yeah this sucks i don't like this, this. Sucks. i'm like a barely literate person like all this stuff is kind of intuitive to me so mm. you know like the potato scene kind of gives you the impression that like chapayev he's like street smart and brave and not really like you know the master tactician that he kind of gets compared to you know especially when they're like it's funny when you know he gets compared to like Napoleon, and he's like, "Oh yeah, Napoleon had it easy. He didn't have to deal with airplanes." And which you know <laughs> you is know? is a valid is a valid point. Uh, um, and I, yeah, I like I like the way that it illustrates the kind of difference between like as you say his his kind of street smarts and like the formal education, yes. and it shows that he is he's good at thinking on his feet though because there's that. There's again, it's it's part of the humor, and one of the guys in in this big crowd is like, "So, uh, Chapayev, are you for the communists or the Bolsheviks?" <laughs> right. <laughs> and and you know, this is a very much, I'm sure it's a wink to the audience. It's like, ah, uh, you know, dumb rustic, um, <laughs> peasant <laughs> type type thing, and and then. Chapayev says, oh, "I'm for I'm for the international," and and then the commissar kind of puts him on the spot because he's like, "Well, which international?" And you know, this is where uh, <laughs> he's kind of like, well, doesn't he say like, "Well, which ones?" He's like, "I'm for the right one." Like, come on, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and yeah, and the commissar is like, "No, I'm going to push you on this." He doesn't say that, but he 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 is like, "And which one is that?" Because you got the second international, and you got the third international, and Chapayev because he's because he's smart goes well which one was lenin in and yes. he's like well it was the third one in that case that one and the commissar is kind of like okay fair enough fair enough <laughs> which also like there there's definitely a uh, a dimension to that that relates to the 1934 politics when he had still living mm. civil war heroes who were uh, Trotskyites and right, that sort of thing right. who were being disappeared right around that time like i know uh, konstantin simonov who um it's like a famous writer and he co-wrote uh 20 days without or well it's like from his notes that alexi german made the film 20 days without war gotcha and he hooked up with them after seeing uh trial on the road but like at the time 1930s he was sort of criticizing chapaya for you know basically <laughs> celebrating this dead hero uh who was maybe like not that big of a hero compared to some other people who were but who were being erased from history because it was you know they were in a politically inconvenient position so i think like it's actually like on one hand it feels sort of surprising to be watching this uh, propaganda film where the hero's not really that interested in politics but on the other like I, I think it sort of serves a specific purpose that like you know he's sort of apolitical and dies heroically and that's acceptable but you know, if he believed in the wrong politics, it, that definitely wouldn't have been. Yeah, and I, I mean, he's... I wouldn't go as far as saying he's hes apolitical. He's just... He knows what the right answer is, and he's yeah. just not that fussed about the ideological niceties in the way that the, the commissar right. is. Um, and, and yeah, like like you say, because he's because he's a guy who's not still walking around when the film comes out. That's that's fine. Mm -hmm. That's the standard that you need to meet. And, and, and well, and then you read about the real Chapayev, and like you know, he he was in the Tsar's army during World War One, and was not necessarily you know open communist until it became kind of advantageous for him to be, and was uh, you know maybe somebody who was just more interested in warfare than you know, the, the kind of Bolshevik politics that were surrounding it. Like, he seems, like, disinterested or... Yeah, Yeah. on the other hand, you know, he picked a side and that side happened to be the the red right, side. Right. So, I mean, I don't know <laughs> I don't know enough about the specifics of his biography and his beliefs, you know, why he did that. But, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, you know, he it, there, there is stuff where it's kind of like, yeah, yeah, he, he's, he's for this side. He's just, he's, yeah, just not that fussy right. about the specifics well, i think like it, 
with the film's take on him, it kind of feeds into that like folk hero oh, quality. Yeah. Like you know, he's like a Robin Hood. He's fighting the the rich or the you know the upper class, like Robin Hood, and he's you know from the the lower class and uneducated, trying to make his way and proving that he's uh, smart and resourceful and all that sort of thing. Like that that's a big part of why I think the character is popular. You know, mm. he's the he's uh, in a way the scrappy underdog, I guess. Oh, definitely. Yeah, like it mentions he only learned to read two years ago. I mean, he says it himself. Um... And he's pretty sensitive about, like, when <laughs> when he wants to promote a, a veterinarian to being a doctor, and, like, the their, his soldiers are kind of rolling their eyes at that, and he gets kind of offended, like, well, you know, oh, you, you don't, you just don't want to see a mujik promoted to anything. <laughs> like, he gets actually pretty touchy about, you know, people's idea that, oh, if somebody's... Um, you know, maybe not necessarily class, but it's like, oh, you know, if they're uneducated, they shouldn't be doing certain jobs. And it's like, you know, you can tell Chepaya feels like, oh, I should be able to do anything or any, you know, anyone should be able to do anything. Like, I think that's kind of where his heart is as a as a character in the film anyway. Yeah. And, and that's probably what has him coming down on on the side of uh, of the Reds rather mm-hmm. than rather than the this sort of the more like status quo you know know your place whites right. and that's that's where his sympathies are coming from yes. rather than you know he's read everything uh marx has written and thinks it's really great <laughs> exactly yeah i i still think it's funny how like shifty he gets over the whole looting situation <laughs> like he was just gonna let it slide and he's like like oh like i'm the only one who should be able to uh imprison one of my men and like you know and then like very quickly comes around and gives this like very uh inspiring speech about how uh you know all oh, there are brothers and we're you know we shouldn't be looting and like if you catch me looting you can shoot me kind of a yeah and his whole business about like i'm only your commander when we're fighting the rest of the yeah. time i'm just one of the guys and you should treat me like that mm-hmm. it's it's kind of it's kind of interesting yeah like, I, I it almost felt like you know was this supposed to be even cynical for people in 1934 seeing this, like I think maybe you're seeing through a little bit or like there's a couple moments in the film where uh, I think like, you know, that there's some irony going on um, at, like at the very beginning when he's giving people a hard time for ditching their guns and like, Oh, I threw my gun in the river. And then the next guy's like, Oh, um, I, I stowed the machine gun. I hid it away by the shore. I'll go and get it. Yeah. You know, not that like I, I threw it away in uh, cowardice. And then there's just this one guy, there's a shot of any, like he doesn't have a gun and you can see him just lean in. So it hides the fact that like he's, he's slightly behind this other person. So Chepayev can't see that he doesn't have a gun. Oh, I totally missed that. <laughs> oh, I don't know. It got a laugh out of me. It, it It's, um, you know, there, there's one or two things like that where it sort of makes me think like, oh, okay, like, you're not always supposed to see Chepayev as like the moral voice for every situation mm, or you're mm. not, not always supposed to be like on his side for everything. Well, and he's not super consistent because right. uh, early on in the film, uh, when the commissar has just just arrived, he gives Chepayev a bit of a telling off for the state of the, of the uniform. He's kind of like, you know, we need to be disciplined. We need to... <laughs> And then he flips that. He gives that same speech later on. To, exactly. Um, and it's yeah. kind of like it's it's yeah. It's 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 only like five minutes ago that you came around to the idea that you kind of have to look a certain way. <laughs> um, yeah. But like, I think you know. Again, it makes him feel like a real character, and it sort of speaks to his adaptability and his kind of embracing of uh, you know that the image that he's creating for himself. Actually, I love uh, you know when they finally sees the cabin. And there's that propaganda poster of him running away. Oh, like, yeah. Propaganda poster. And he's just laughing at it. And he's like, oh, like, keep that. I want to keep that. Yeah. You know, he's he's a character. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. On the one hand, he does care about his, his image. And he has that whole, don't you know who I am business some of the time. Mm-hmm. And he sometimes speaks about himself in the third person. But at the same time, yeah, he can laugh about himself. He's not he's not like angry after the fact that the, 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 the whites were you know, painting him as a coward because he's he's secure right. enough in himself to be like, yeah, well, I kind of showed them, didn't I? So, <laughs> so I, you know, I like it. I, I think like he feels three dimensional, and you know, it makes the film feel more alive than if it was just like ah, brave Chapayev, 
the mm. who you know doesn't change his expression once kind of a movie you know because you can find those too yeah yeah and the the actor Boris Babachkin is mm-hmm. is super charismatic he just he's really he just great looks yeah. great I think he did get in trouble politically later on but mm. uh, <laughs> but I I think he met one of the directors in like theater school pretty early yeah. on and yeah I think I read th- that. And their uh, teacher at the theater theater school or the theater troupe played the evil white colonel. Mm, who, again, is is just a fantastic looking face. He's great. It's like, uh, I mean, he's got a mustache on, but it makes me think of like Von Stroheim or one of those guys, like, you know, the monocle or, I don't know, yeah. he's just such a like caricature kind of, of a colonel, evil colonel that I, I kind of like it. Yeah, although it, it, I don't know whether this whether the the scene of him playing the piano is kind of like just I don't I don't I really didn't know how to read that because on the one hand it's it, you know it's showing his sensitive side but he, mm-hmm. he's also yeah he's just given the order for his uh, his Batman's like I guess a brother to be to be executed yeah. and it's just like oh wow after he finds out that he's his bro- he's like oh I didn't know he was your brother. Execute, execute. Right on the yeah, thing. You <laughs> yeah. Know, I, I think it was meant to be like that sort of contradiction of the, you know, high culture doesn't make you civilized. You can still, you know, listen mm. to this beautiful music and be a barbaric be cool. person. Like I, I think that's kind of where that scene was coming from. The actor who plays the the servant or the, I guess he's a Batman, mm. uh, and he actually gives a really good performance too. He's sort of oh, quiet, he's great. Sad. Uh, he's uh, I, just by coincidence, I I saw him also in V, which I watched. Um, shortly a little while ago and he plays the cossack and that's a film mm. from 1960 so that's like 30 years later but <laughs> yeah so they must have like the makeup he, he must be wearing either that or in v he's really really old but yeah because he looks <laughs> he looks kind of up there in years in this but he might be like 60s or something in v. i i didn't mm. check what his age was gotcha but, gotcha uh, yeah like, i think he's also in um dovchenko's i think he's in strike maybe okay. I don't know, i'm gonna have to double check but like he, he's been in a bunch of things but um but that scene where pietka is going to take him him prisoner but then yeah but then relents and doesn't that's i i found that genuinely like quite affecting because mm-hmm. you know the guy just looks like so sad he his looks so sad like he, his, how could his you brother's not? gonna die yeah yeah and, and and you know and you know like from a military point of view it's just like no you're the enemy screw you this is <laughs> you're coming with us mm-hmm. Um, but you're like, oh, good for you, Petko. You did you did the humane thing rather than the, you know, right. going by the book. And he almost gets but, in I trouble mean, for it, which, like, if I was Petko, I would just lie. But, <laughs> but then, yeah, I just didn't know, find the, uh, anyone. Yeah. <laughs> but then the Batman comes back, so it, it turns out okay for Petko. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And and that is an example of yeah, Chapayev being you know being a bit more of a you know by the book. No, the rule is. <laughs> You don't show compassion on the enemy, dumbass. Right. Uh, I mean, he's like, yeah, I get it, but still, you should have taken the guy prisoner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's it's, it's kind of interesting, just showing like the, the you know the responsibility and the and the the difficulty of being in command is that is that sometimes the uh, the humane thing really isn't <laughs> the 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 sound military <laughs> decision. Right. I think like a lot of war films kind of, or, you know, more sensitive war films or anti-war films kind of struggle with that aspect of, uh, you know, what the humane thing is to do versus what the militaristic thing is to do. And, um, what what the thing is you have to do in order to win the war. Yeah. Right. Right. So like a lot of films sort of struggle with that theme. Um, yeah. But I was surprised that a film like this produced in this climate was even raising something like that Mm -hmm. like it's it it ends up being like i think the message that you're meant to take away from it in that propagandistic context is like hey the guy's just a batman he's not really like like he's basically a servant and you know his enemy is the white colonel too like you know really he's on our side and it's just like you have to give him that chance i think like it's kind of mm, yeah coming probably. from there you know it's like of course he's going to turn around and surrender and join them but uh, 
you know, like, it, 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 he's the one sort of character on the white side where he's portrayed as, like, a very sympathetic character. Yeah, yeah, although the the general, yeah, he's portrayed as nasty, but he is also portrayed as competent, which, yes. again, I, I guess that just means it's effective propaganda. You know, I, like, I think it speaks to the, the savviness of the propaganda side of this film. Like, you know, when we were talking earlier, like, it's not beat you over the head propaganda, but it's still, like, consistently nothing but propaganda (laughs) like you know it's propaganda that's entertaining and you like it's it's um well that's the most insidious kind is is, is the stuff where you have to (laughs) actually be you know be paying attention rather than yeah battleship potomkin is really like biffy around the nose with it yeah and like propaganda that's obvious is also very easy to dismiss you know and Mm. i think uh, when you're watching something as entertainment and just kind of consuming it it's a lot easier to just digest and internalize that propaganda and that ideology like i think you know people should be uh, you know maybe a little bit wary of some of the things they watch and what they're actually saying and uh, i mean you know some people might take it too far reading <laughs> you know reading like way into certain things but uh, you know just sometimes like the consumable entertainment you actually have to like stop and think like you know what's this actually saying you know and and even and even if you come to the the final conclusion that say 300 isn't promoting fascism maybe it is who knows um i'm not i'm not pinning my colors to the mast but it's worth asking the question <laughs> right and like, like as you say it's it's good to be in in that habit of not just being like oh well you know i'm sure nobody has an agenda here so <laughs> right just turn your brain off and I don't, I, I don't know. Maybe I, I, there's no takeaway to be had from that film. I don't know. But uh, no, the ma- the main the main takeaway is violence is cool. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, that's the main takeaway from Three Hundred. Uh, anyway, <laughs> speaking of uh, violence is cool, uh, mm. Chapayev. Uh, no, sorry. Um, I was going to make some connection to Alexander the Great, which comes up in Chai- Chapayev, and I f- totally forgot my segue. But <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no word. But yeah, that that was an example of 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 where you know the like formally educated, book smart commissar comes up against the the more rustic Chapayev. Yeah. Right, he hasn't heard of Alexander the Great, and then and and he, and he's really miffed by it. He's he's like, I should know who this guy is. And yeah. he's irked. He doesn't like it. Well, and he does kind of get the last word on it because, you know, when the commissar is trying to correct his uh, his appearance, his decorum, <laughs> Chapayev is like, well, how do you know how Alexander the Great... He lived 200 lived years ago. 2,000 years ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 sorry. T- yes, <laughs> 2,000 years, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so, like, again, that's the kind of cleverness of Chapayev. Like, he might be ignorant, but he's not stupid, you know. Yeah, and and they're not synonyms. Yeah, they're they're, yes. they're generally yes, <laughs> which is <laughs> which is a distinction that is easy to easy to miss, and particularly if you are somebody who has had you know a decent formal education, is that that there is like kind of a built in temptation with that to assume that people who don't have that you know sure. don't I mean I've met some don't know educated stuff. people, so it goes both ways. <laughs> Well, well, yes, yeah, yeah, it, it, exactly. Sorry, I was kind of getting slightly on my moral, <laughs> moral high horse there, but <laughs> no, that, that's fine. Well, uh, like I was going to say, reading about uh, the real Ferbinov and Chapayev's relationship, like it, it seems like it was quite a bit different. Like he was still, it was fraught, but in a different way. It, it was fraught in a different way, right? Right. Like, I don't, it sounds like he had kind of. Um, like maybe an inferiority complex around this guy who you know was very charismatic and very... oh definitely that definitely came across like i really like i think if you ever remade this film or you know made a new chapaya film like i think if you went back to like the original diaries and like try to be sort of true to history it would be really interesting because like that story to me is more interesting actually than what ends up on screen mm. and uh you know the the whole idea of Fermanov, uh, his wife having an affair with Chapayev, and that's why he. Yeah, although the, I just the, my reading of the book was not necessarily that an affair happened. It's just that 
Chapayev was kind of sniffing around. Right. I mean, it's hard to tell because, like, I think th- those diaries were kind of uh, suppressed and didn't come out till later, and it was sort of like a literary scandal a little bit, and, uh, like... It's sort of vague the way it's written and like, mm. oh, like Chapayev, what do you mean? Like writing this letter that says like, I love you at the end of it to my wife and that kind yeah, of thing. Yeah, so which it's you hard know, to tell. Fair enough. Yeah, <laughs> fair enough. You know, and uh, but that's basically the reason why Fermanov requested a transfer. Mm. And that was yeah, which like, the film does a, not cover. No, in in the film, it's like my work here is done. <laughs> my my planet needs me, <laughs> Chapayev. <laughs> you know, here's my replacement. <laughs> yeah <laughs> so like it, it's very different it's like well you know like i gotta move on like there's other people who need me like here's your new commissar and you know they have that very kind of emotional he gives the new commissar a pretty cold shoulder too but you know they have that very warm goodbye where he gives him a hug and a kiss yeah it's like they go to they go to shake hands and he's like no come here man yeah <laughs> gives him a big <laughs> right. hug and a kiss you know? yeah and uh but like you know real life uh he left and that was only about a month before Chapayev was killed. So he actually mm. felt like he had really complicated feelings after he wrote uh, something to his wife, which is basically yeah, like... Yeah, because I think after he had been moved, I I think I remember reading that he basically regretted it and tried to ask for the the order to to go somewhere else to be rescinded. And they were like, yeah. no, we've we've decided. So off you go. Um, so yeah, that was that was interesting. I mean, like... Well, and then like telling his wife, like... And then feeling, like, really guilty after Chapayev gets killed and, like, telling his wife, like, also, hey, I love you and I forgive you for anything that happened between you and Chapayev because, like, if I didn't get jealous, I'd be dead. <laughs> like, yeah. these really complicated feelings that I found really interesting and, like, mm. that's a real kind of strange human love triangle that, like, you know, like, apparently he kind of put it or played with putting it in the book and then took it out and then he well, put it in the screenplay and took it out and he sort of never really knew what to do with these feelings i think which i don't like i yeah and the fact in 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 the book as i understand he changed the name so the the yeah. the commissar is a different guy who doesn't have his name and then in the film they changed it back i mean yes i imagine partly because fermanov by that point was dead but yeah right. there's definitely you can definitely see a remake which has a kind of like mozart salieri amadeus yes thing yeah, that, going that along because be yeah. cause you've got yeah, you've got the guy who has has all the formal education but doesn't have like the raw talent. No, that, that, like or charisma. That like if your wife's has. attracted to like this other guy who's like charming and a natural leader and it's just like he's everything that you're not and how that makes you feel, but you also kind of love the guy and like feel bad when he does like Because I, the I charisma know, I, works on you too. Because the charisma works on you too. Like I could see that. And being you hate really that it interesting. Does. Yeah. yeah. Oh definitely. You know, so I think like just reading you know the periphery stuff in preparation like i found that to be the most interesting just that that side of the story which you know hasn't really been told anywhere properly yeah can't can't necessarily see that coming out of the the modern russian federation right now <laughs> I, I, I guess not yeah on, on the other hand it's it's they have such a a, a weird thing with with film in, in that you've got Zvegintsev making films that are very scathing about modern realities. It's almost like yeah. a things couldn't be possibly be as bad as they're depicted in this because otherwise, you know, we wouldn't allow this to be shown. There's kind of like this sort of smarter about censorship than the Soviets were because the Soviets mm-hmm. were just like anything that's critical, that's not happening unless unless you know we're genuinely not paying attention because obviously we've on this podcast we've we've covered uh welcome or no trespassing which is just right. is insane that that got that that got past them but uh um but yeah generally there was there was a like no can't do that can't say that this isn't allowed but i think also like russian audiences always sort of liked things that are tinged with sadness like mm. uh, i forget which hollywood movie it was but it's like well you know that or uh, w- which film it was i forget now the story but it's like uh, they had to shoot one version where the you know the couple meet and fall in love at the end and then that's for the american audience and then for the russian audience like oh like the guy dies you know <laughs> it yeah, always has well... to be a little bit like that and you know even the romance in chapayev which is still pretty it's pretty tame, but like, mm. you know, Petka has to die at the end. And that that story of that Chapayev says about, oh, after the war, you're going to be happy and, you know, you're going to wish you live forever and everything like, you know, that becomes, again, ironic and sort of tainted with melancholy because, you know, it's not going to happen. And um, 
And then there's the use of the song Chordani Voron, which is like Black Crow. Um, yes. And this was a song I was actually familiar with before the, the film. It's a very famous Russian folk song that's been around for a long, long time. Um, and basically, I, I don't know how well subtitled it was in the version that I saw. It was kind of intermittent, but I mm-hmm. kind of knew it anyway. So it's basically like this, this guy... <laughs> You know, who's who? who, I think he's been wounded, and he can see these crows flying around, and he's basically like, "Go away, crows! You can't have me." Mm -hmm. And then at the end of the song, he he realizes, "Okay, I'm definitely dying, crow. You get to have me after all." Kind of thing. That's sort of the gist of it. So the fact that that's in this film, and Chapayev is one of the people singing it, it's very much a like wink, wink, nudge, nudge. (laughs) <laughs> we all know this guy dies at the end kind of thing, if you're the Russian audience, at least. I mean, the way it's portrayed in the film, I, I get the sense that, like, Chapayev as a character, he sort of, he knows that he can only kind of get away by the skin of his teeth so many times, like, mm. just playing this game sooner or later, it's going to end bad for him. You yeah. Know, the way he's talking to, like, Petka and uh, Anka, like, you know, he, he's talking like he's not going to be around for that you know he's i i think he doesn't expect to live through the war in the way he's portrayed in the film anyway Mm, well and going back to the sort of comedy potato scene there's there's this thing where like he's he basically says that on paper he believes that, that it's important for the commander to to live and to put himself in a position where right. he protects himself so he doesn't get killed and so the men still have leadership and then one of his men is like yeah, but you know that's that's a lie. You know you're always in the thick of the action. He's like, right. yeah, well, there are there is <laughs> there, when necessary. So it's yeah. kind of like just acknowledging that 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 he kind of knows that there's that there's a, a fatalism to his character. It, like, yeah, you know, that really comes through in the final action set piece. You know, mm. when he's up in the top of the building and they they're shooting the machine gun out the window as the armored car comes up and. Oh yeah, that 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 is kind of like menacing how that's used. It's yeah. just like, uh oh, <laughs> right? You know, and him swimming in the river, being like, you know, you're not going to get me. You, you know, I'm, they they totally are. <laughs> you know, th- th- it feels like a, maybe not metaphorical because I think that's how he really died. But you know, yeah. it, it just feels like you know somebody who's almost in over their head, and then they're in over their head. You know, it's just mm. like you can only kind of keep it up for so long until until yeah. they get you. It catches up with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I remember hearing that in the uh, pre World War One era, so super, super early uh, mm-hmm. cinema, there was a thing similar to what you were saying that, but it was a regular thing. There was like a supposedly a Russian ending that you would, you would often just have a different ending to films where yes. the lead character died, and that that was just the version they showed in Russia because that was apparently what the audience was into it's just like, right, right. that's so weird and yeah please listener if you know if you can verify that this is an actual thing and not just you know <laughs> a horrible stereotype coming out then then please let us know um I, i'm it, gonna have to think of what, what it was specifically but it, like just you know speaking to your point about showing things in a kind of depressing way i think mm. like you know you can sort of be depressing without necessarily being critical of like the reasons why or mm. like uh, there's a film i think it's called the fool which came out a couple of years ago i don't know if you've seen it about the apartment building that has the the fault in it no i haven't i haven't seen it but i i've seen the very evocative poster i was kind of like huh oh. maybe i should see that at some point okay you, you might want to check that out at some time mm. for the, the podcast because that's the one that deals with uh, contemporary russian issues and and it does it in a in a pretty playful way, but it, it's you know less about the depressing reality and more about bureaucracy and more about uh, corruption, <laughs> that sort of thing. I, I would mm. say, and it kind of actually targets maybe some of the reasons why. But yeah, that does sound interesting. We'll have, definitely have to check that one out. So I I feel like we're kind of reaching a kind of natural end to the podcast. I guess mm-hmm. I just I did want to just mention that. One of the other, and it's a super fascinating book, Julian Graffy's Chapayev. It's it's well worth if you can get hold of it, uh, uh, picking picking up. They mentions that in the Second World War, the film was reshown for its its propaganda potential, but it also used the fact that 
you know how you know what they say always leave it open for a sequel they did actually make a short film in which chapayev like it turns out he's not dead and uh, <laughs> and basically you know he comes along and just like you didn't think they got me right and, it, and it's just a very world war Two propaganda you know go and get the enemy type thing and i'm i'm curious to see whether i can find that because it sounds it sounds ridiculous but also also kind of fun at the same time yes i I would be curious to see it also just um i don't remember whether the book said or not whether it was barbachkin reprising the role of chapayev i I feel like it would have had to have been and it was world war ii was close enough to when this film came out you could do that without (laughs) just being (laughs) insane that you're casting this guy as the same character many right. years later or something like that but yeah i just thought i was an interesting little coder yeah i wish i wish i could have somebody fire a gun into the air to make everyone quiet when i wanted to think <laughs> oh, oh yeah that was great yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um yeah i realized i, I made a mistake it tends to get you arrested these days <laughs> Uh, it's it's fun to think about. It's just it's so ridiculous. Like oh, like Chapayev needs to think. Like everyone quiet. You know, Knock it off. Yeah. Knock it off. And <laughs> um, I, I I realized I I said uh, the actor who plays the Batman. He oh yeah. Uh, so the, his first film was in Dovchenko's Earth. I think I said Dovchenko's Strike, which is double wrong because that's Eisenstein's Strike. And yeah, yeah. I, I so I screwed up there, but. <laughs> No, uh, no worries. <laughs> I'll, do, uh, I'll do a very, yeah, a very obvious edit where I just drop you saying like, <laughs> saying Earth in a very different tone of voice right over the top <laughs> and no one will know. Um, but I, I think that's about it, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so where can listeners find your your other other stuff um, if they're if they're curious about checking that out? Uh, best place is on Twitter at Movie Kessler. That's where I do all my updates and ridiculous things. <laughs> awesome. Um, yeah, it's well worth giving Martin a follow. It's it's so interesting. I I learn so much film stuff just <laughs> you know on a regular basis. <laughs> Sorry, that's, that was the most awkward. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll take it. Thanks. <laughs> um, yeah, off the cuff uh, <laughs> plug you'll ever receive, but. Uh, <laughs> Never mind. Anyway, so Martin, thank you so much for for coming on again. This is, um, I probably wouldn't have seen this this film. I wouldn't have heard of it. I mean, I probably would have come across it eventually, but certainly the fact that you were interested in in covering it moved it right up the priority list. So, so thank you very much. And I promise, now that you've seen it, you'll see it everywhere. It's it's like one of those things where oh, like now that you know what it is, it's it's all over the place. Yeah, yeah, definitely. All right, well, uh, take care and uh, dust it folks. Dust it down, yeah. So that's it for this episode, but before I go, I'd like to thank Sasha Ilukovich and the Highly Skilled Migrants for the use of their song Cold in our intro. You can find that song and the rest of their back catalogue on Bandcamp and Spotify. If you're enjoying the show, please consider supporting us by leaving a rating at Apple Podcasts or at podchaser.com. That second one, Podchaser, even lets you rate individual episodes, so if this episode particularly stood out to you, you can let other listeners know that you enjoyed it. Recommending the show on social media is hugely helpful as well. If you can spare a moment or two to do that, it would really make my day. Thank you, thank you very much. Speaking of social media... Please find us and say hi on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also drop us a line at roosfilesunite at gmail.com. Thanks again for listening, take care of yourselves, and bye for now. Чорний ворон, чор
черный ворон, что ты вьешься надо мной, ты добычи не добьешься. Да.